What's up guys, welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. This is episode number 106 being recorded on the 1st of May and I cannot believe we are already nearly halfway through the year into the uh, month of May. So last week I was speaking with Rod Cleef. Now, if you have not heard that episode, you absolutely should go back and have a listen to that episode number 105. Uh, Rod is a multifamily investor. Multifamily, in if you're outside of the US, it kind of means apartment block uh, investor. And uh, he got um, knocked down badly by the 2008 crash and he came bouncing back and has done very well. And so it's a really good episode, well worth you guys listening in on. This week, I am going to respond to a comment that I received on my Instagram uh, profile. I'll link it up here if you're watching on the YouTube. At first, I kind of thought this person was kind of winding me up because the comment seemed a little bit sort of silly and I don't know whether he was kind of trolling me or something like that. But actually, then I thought to myself, no, there is actually a, you know, a legitimate sort of feeling out there. And so I'm going to get into that today. And so um, stay tuned and I'll explain more. And if you are watching on the uh, YouTube version, welcome and I hope you're enjoying it. And um, without further ado, let's get into the show. You are listening to Behind the Facade, and I'm your host, Gavin J. Gallagher. On this podcast, I explore the mental and emotional game often playing out subconsciously, both in your mind and the mind of everyone else in the real estate or property investment market. The key to success in this game is to master your mindset and behavior, to take control of your thoughts, your emotions, and most importantly, your ego. Welcome to the show. All right, welcome back, folks. And uh, before I get started into the main topic today, I just want to give a quick shout out and thank you to my friend and fellow podcaster, Carol Tallon. Now, Carol, uh, uh, she's from PropTech Ireland, and she has a number of different companies that she kind of works with. But she um, she was actually a guest on this podcast way back um, about a year ago, episode number 50, if you'd like to go and check it out. Um, but Carol was very good to invite me to the National Property Awards during the week. So Thursday evening, we went to the uh, Intercontinental Hotel in Balls Bridge in Dublin. And it was a really nice black tie affair. I put some, posted some photos up in, uh, uh, on my LinkedIn if you want to go and check it out. And uh, also sitting at my table, one of uh, Carol's guests was Galen Bales. Now Galen is also, if you guys are listening for a while to this show you will recognize the name. He was my guest on episode number 54. And Galen talked about, you know, selling his business and, you know, growing a rapid, you know, very, very fast growing business. And it was another excellent discussion. I'm like, well, I do recommend that you go and check those out. So I'll leave links below if you're interested in the show notes. So what happens at the National Property Awards? Well, it's kind of obvious it's an award ceremony, obviously, but it's all about real estate and property investing. And so there was various awards, kind of like the the Real Estate Agency of the Year and the Best ESG Initiative of the Year and the Property Management Company of the Year and the Building Contractor of the Year and the the Best Developer of the Year and so on. And I'm sure you're used to seeing those kind of awards being given out various places. There was also, and this was an interesting one for me, um, a Lifetime Achievement Award, and it was awarded to Ken McDonald of Hook McDonald. Now, I know Ken very well, and um, I actually attended college with his daughter, Rena, and um, I think it was a very, very well-deserved reward or award, and um, he's a very humble man, and he's gone and he's built up, you know, one of the longest established estate agencies and the most respected estate agencies in the country. And so my, uh, I just like to kind of recognize that I do think he's a very worthy receiver of that first time uh, award for lifetime achievement. Anyways, great night out. And again, I'd like to thank Carol. The only thing I thought was missing in the night was they didn't have the best real estate podcast award. And that is something that I definitely would like to see uh, next year. And sure, well, you'll have to wait and see what happens. So look, let's get into the main topic, and I'm going to be kind of flying through this today. Um, what I'm going to do is, I, first of all, I mentioned that this comment was left on my Instagram, and if you don't follow my Instagram, I'm going to read it out now, and um, I'll post it uh, up on the screen if you're, if you're watching on the YouTube, but it says, 
where are the chimneys? So there's a photograph of some of the houses that are actually now being built. And it's, where are the chimneys? And he, he says that it's effectively making it illegal to keep yourself and your family warm by fire. These green houses, he says, will fall apart within the next 20 years, if not before. And that it is very irresponsible of the government allowing this to happen. Homes being built need to last for generations to come. Now, uh, at first I kind of thought, you know, this is just somebody giving out about something. But actually, I thought to myself, no, nah, you know, I do understand, like, there's the first time I ever went into a house, one of these new houses, and it didn't have chimneys. I was kind of like, Where, where's the fireplace? Because you're used to, in society, you're kind of used to a certain way of, you know, here in Ireland, we would typically go into somebody's house and you would sit uh, around sofas and chairs that would be around a fireplace. And that is the kind of just the way it is, you know. And um, however, if you go to other places around the world and stuff like that, if you go to somebody's apartment in New York City, there are no fireplaces, clearly. And so you just sort of that isn't something that you factor in. So you got to remember that this is kind of a, a societal kind of a, a norm here in Ireland, but it's not necessarily in other parts of the world. Now, when I saw that comment, I was initially kind of thinking, you know, uh, well, what should I say about this? You know, I do recognize that, uh, but why do we have no chimneys in houses? And like, let's get into it. What I'm actually going to go and talk about today is I'm going to talk about the, the, the past, the present, and the future of the housing market. And I'm just going to reflect back. What I wanted to do is... First of all, mention that I grew up in an old house. I, my parents' home was built around 1900. And so um, it had pretty poor standards of insulation at the time. We had a big old oil burning uh, central heating system. And uh, you had to fill that up every couple of months. And it was like a 600 liter tank. And so by today's prices, you'd probably be looking at like 1200 euro to fill this thing and it's a couple of times a year you'd have to fill it and um but i have to admit there was nothing more comfortable than coming in on a winter's night and there was a nice toasty fire lit in the uh, in the tv room and you know we'd sit in there the parents uh we'd all sit around the tv and the fireplace and just you know watch a show or something like that and it's i got some nice memories going back so i'm definitely a fan of the open fire and yes um I definitely love popping over at Christmas to visit my mom. She still lives in the old house and, you know, Christmas time she lights the fireplaces and it's just a very welcoming kind of a thing um, for anyone who is familiar. I'm sure you'll recognize that and you'd agree. So I definitely don't have any kind of agenda against fireplaces and chimneys and all this kind of stuff. But if you fast forward to today and, um, you know, that same house we're talking about, the house that I grew up in, 40 years, my mom has been living there now. And uh, what's the impression that I get today? Well, she's still lighting the fire, but it's not for those nice memories. It is actually because it is literally the only home, the only room in the house that she can get comfortable in. And that is because it is freezing cold the house for the rest of the house like all of the other rooms are absolutely freezing cold in the winter time and my mom now would, would wear you know two or three jumpers and cardigans and stuff like that just as a matter of course because she's used to it and i'm not going to go and change her mind uh, you know at this stage of her life but for anyone who's used to living in say a normal home uh, a modern home nowadays where you would have um, modern conditions and things like that there is, you, you just would not see this as a, as a habitable house in, in many respects. And I know that um, when I was living abroad, I used to come home and, and visit my mother. And I would stay for a couple of days because uh, I didn't have a place in Ireland at the time that I was living abroad. And so I'd stay. And I remember in the winter time, sort of getting into the bed and it apps like having to leave my clothes on to get in and warm up the bed. It was that cold. It was bitterly cold. And uh, like, okay, you could put things like electric blankets on and stuff like that. But anyone who's used to just sort of jumping into a bed and feeling kind of, you know, comfortable, it's not nice to jump into something. And it actually, it's kind of like icy. The sheets are actually feel icy. And, uh, and so that was the kind of impression that I got when I was coming back to go, to go and live in this uh, or to stay there with my mum. And it's, it's, you know, I, I cannot see it as being particularly good for my mother's long-term health as well. 
And so this is this is just a bit of an issue that I that I recognize now looking back and uh, and just look, you know, knowing the standards of building today versus the way it was in the past. And you don't even have to go back that far. I mean, houses of 20 years ago are pretty badly designed in terms of insulation standards and stuff like that. So going forward to today, let, let's talk about building uh, regulations and, and standards and stuff. I remember as a young architect specifying uh, and when I was designing a house or something like that, I'd be specifying the insulation that would be going into, say, a cavity wall. And I can remember drawing this, and it would be a 50 mil cavity and a 50 mil piece of um, insulation board. Today, that same piece of insulation is now 175 mil. So it is more than three times the size. And the difference between the living environment of a house today versus one of those of the past, it's just absolutely black and white like there's such a difference it's incredible and the new houses nowadays are so well insulated and they have just such high standards of insulation and all of these different things that um, you don't even really need to turn on the heat from one end of the year to the next um, like just the fact that there are a couple of people in the house creates generates heat and that heat is not lost. And things like cooking and you know, boil, uh, you know, having a shower or something like that, the heat that is generated from the hot water and from the cooking and all that, that heats the rooms. And that room, that heat does not dissipate and it just sort of like warms up the house. And so it is really, really interesting to sort of see that when you're used to living in a house where you turn on the central heating, the, the heat you know, builds up in the house and then you switch it off and half an hour later you're cold again and you need to kind of switch that back on. It's very interesting to see um, how these new houses just retain the heat for so long. And um, so that is one of the things that really makes a big difference. But one of the other things that not just the insulation, it's actually there's this air tightness test that they now do on houses. And when you're building a house now, there has to be pretty much airtight in order for it to retain its heat. And so things like chimneys are a complete no-no because burning any kind of fossil fuel means that you've got to have an open fireplace. And uh, even without an open fireplace, if you put in like a stove or something like that, it still sucks air through. Um, and so you lose heat through the chimney. You also have things like letter boxes and things like that in older houses that kind of are cut into the doorway. That's another way, of, that's another terrible draft. I know in the place that I live at today um, that in the wintertime, I actually have to tape up the, the, fire, or the, the letter box because the draft is so severe through that letterbox in the in the winter months that I just put this huge big sort of piece of um, plastic or across it and I just block it up. So it just gives you an idea. Now beyond that new homes we also put PV cells on the roof. And this allows us to actually heat the water of the house uh, completely free uh, through the solar power and um, I'm currently living in a house in the in the Black Rock area that was built in the 90s so it's only about 25 years old. But I can tell you the cost of heat in the house, first of all, is pretty, is pretty staggering. And that is because what I mentioned earlier, you turn on the heat and it's nice and you know, warm and then you turn it off. And within half an hour, the, 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 some of the rooms are quite cold. And those are the rooms that are on the outside wall with outside walls. So the houses, the, the rooms on the corners in particular, where they have two outside walls, they cool very, very quickly. And my young daughter, who's only five years old, she lives, uh, she sleeps in a room that's on the corner of the house. And uh, her room is, has got two external walls and it gets so cold so quickly in that room. And so most nights she gets, she wakes up freezing cold and she'll come into our room and she jumps into bed with mommy and daddy. So um, that is one of the issues with her wall. And you, I suppose you could address it. You could go in and you could add extra insulation. But what it does is it makes the room smaller. And they're already small enough rooms. Anyway, enough about my home and enough about that. Let's talk about what's happening into the future. And this is, you know, what's, where is this all going and where are we going? And I think, like, in my humble opinion, I feel we're living in a very, very significant moment in time. And very similar to what happened in March of 2020, when the pandemic struck and we were all suddenly in this massive like global lockdown. And a lot of societal changes took place in that moment. Uh, we all started working from home and it's actually suddenly hard to shake that now. But in addition to that, 
we went from um, n thinking that things like Zoom and virtual meetings and all that, they were kind of like this strange thing that a few kind of tech people did. Suddenly, everybody is doing Zoom meetings across, the, uh, across business. Pretty much everybody does it nowadays. Now, that is a, an absolute sea change from what the, the was before. January of 2020, hardly anyone was using Zoom. By April of 2020, almost everybody was using Zoom. And sure enough, Zoom's stock price went through the roof for a couple of uh, months or whatever. Um, now, in the past week, Vladimir Putin, uh, the invasion of, you know, by Russia on Ukraine and stuff like that, Vladimir Putin has switched off the gas for Poland and Bulgaria. And I just saw in the newspaper headlines uh, in the last day or so here in Ireland, I saw that the Irish government is now planning to ration fuel because they're expecting that the, the likely next step for Vlad Vladimir Putin is to escalate and to actually shut off gas to Europe. Now, we'll have to wait and see when, whether that happens or not, but they are talking about having four tiers of importance around fuel usage. And the lowest tier is motorists. And so, you know, we're going to actually have a situation where fuel for your car is going to be rationed and you're not going to be able to, you're going to have to make, you know, specific journeys. Obviously, farming and food production is going to get the, is going to have the top um, uh, level of importance. And then there's different tiers going down. But I've just recently read that in Germany, they're now switching off the, the big uh, municipal swimming pools. They're switching off the heat to those. So the water in those pools will now be cold when you're getting in. There's also a massive impact on industry because a lot of big factories, especially in Germany, they have a, obviously a major industrial kind of sector. Those factories need massive amounts of gas to do things like glass production. And um, I, I've been reading about different uh, sectors that you know they use an awful lot of fuel and they of, often um, use gas as a raw material for the production of various plastics and stuff like that. So all of that is going to be impacted. But where does that leave us? Well, I think that in the same way that COVID you know, changed uh, the way society did a lot of things, I actually think that we're now at a point where energy security, the fact that a person who is now a bad actor in the views of the rest of the world can just switch off the gas and leave us all in this terrible position where we can't heat our homes and all this, I think energy security is now going to become number one for an awful lot of governments. And being beholden to Russia has left us extremely exposed and vulnerable and left our economies in a really, really precarious position. I mean, the only reason Germany hasn't switched off the gas, even though it's paying something like 450 million euros a day to Russia, which obviously everyone's up in arms against that because this is how he is, you know, basically funding his war. But they cannot afford to switch that off because the cost of switching off that gas to the industry would be absolutely colossal and therefore they're all very very concerned about this so i think that we're in a situation now where you, you can't win you if the if the fuel gets switched off we're all going to have to make you know figure out how to live with it but then in addition to that we've got a situation where to find a replacement for russia because russia's fuel russia is the biggest producer of oil and gas for the european sort of continent and so um we're sort of used to having it piped into our homes and stuff if you want to go and use another alternative, like, for example, I lived in Qatar for a couple of years, and Qatar is one of the biggest suppliers of gas in the world. But they're, you know, in the Middle East, and the only way they can get their you know, gas around is in these huge ships, um, LNG ship, uh, shipping or whatever. And it's, uh, I think they basically, they cool it down and it shrinks, and so they, they're able to put these huge ships um, and to carry it. But you need special LNG terminals to receive this kind of stuff. So I don't even know if the Irish market could take it. Certainly I know they are building, and I think in Denmark they're starting to build all of these things because they recognize this. But in my view, where what this is doing is in the same way that COVID pushed us all into Zoom and all this kind of stuff, I think we are going to be pushing faster and faster and faster towards a whole renewable energy sector. And you know we've, we've got solar and we've got wind. And everyone's doing that because of, you know, climate change and stuff like that. But suddenly you're into a situation where it's not just climate change. It's now energy security. We need to move to a situation where we cannot have somebody come along and just switch off the gas for us unless we do what he wants. And in addition to that, you've got to think to yourself, OK, let's go and start bringing in 
gas from Qatar. Well, it could take a couple of years to go and build a terminal for that. And on top of that, the cost of it, because everyone's now using their gas instead of Russia's gas, the cost has gone up. So you've got a couple of years of delay plus the extra cost. Why not channel this extra cost and this financial resources into solar and wind? And if it goes into solar and wind, then you've got control of it. Nobody can switch off wind and solar when you have control of it in your own country. And, and so I kind of, kind of think that is going to be a big thing. That is going to be a, uh, a big aspect of the sec energy security that we're looking for. Now, leave that aside for one moment, which I think is a major consideration. But in the past week or two, I've been reading the papers, and I, and I pay attention to this kind of stuff, but um, you had a, a, this very, very unusual moment um, in terms of global climate. And the Arctic and the Antarctic both registered the highest temperature that they have recorded above their average in history. And it was absolutely crazy. Never before levels have been seen. In Antarctica, which is the South Pole, it was 40 degrees Celsius above the average annual temperature. And they have 26% less sea ice there this year than, the average, than, than normal years. Now, the very same week in the North Pole, the Arctic, the same um, 30 degrees above Celsius, that is, above the average levels um, that are recorded over history. And so this is really alarming because a lot of scientists have been talking about, you know, cli climate change and stuff, but nobody predicted anything like those kind of increases above average. And so what you could have is rapid melting of sea ice. And I know that Greenland... Um, during the last couple of, last year or so, normally Greenland back in 1991, the average temperature at the top of green of this mountain in Greenland or the top of this glacier in Greenland was minus 70, and this year the temperature was hitting 20 degrees above. That's above zero, and so it's it's really melting very very quickly. And so when you look at all this kind of stuff, when you take the energy security issue, um, the fact that the Russian uh, situation at the moment is completely out of everyone's control. Nobody knows what he's going to do next. And then you've got climate change, and everyone was pushing already in the direction of uh, sustainability and climate change and all that. And then on top of that, you've got um, ESG now becoming a major uh, factor for a lot of industry, uh, a lot of companies and stuff like that. I, and I've talked about that regularly on the podcast in the past. I think we're going to see the government doubling down on all this stuff and you're going to see the need to do green, uh, sustainable houses, carbon emissions, all of this stuff is going to become front and centre. What they're going to want is people spending an awful lot less on fuel. Uh, people are going to want to do this themselves because of the cost of these things. And then let's finally not forget the final little sort of straw that broke the camel's back, shall we say is that we've got inflation now and inflation is out of control i saw the latest figures from the us is 8.5 percent um in the month which is the highest level ever recorded i think now at this stage Pre previously they were saying the highest level recorded since the 80s now it is just the highest level recorded and so um here in ireland it's the same it's, it's higher than ever england is the same higher than ever and the stock market crashed during the week as a result of this because suddenly the stock market traders who've all been living this kind of uh, imaginary world for the last couple of years, they suddenly realized they're not going to get bailed out this time because in the past, whenever there was kind of a correction in the market, you would have these central banks would just kind of lower interest rates and suddenly it's all bouncing back. Now we're in a situation where inflation is so out of control that there's no way that they can do this. And so what's most likely is going to be a major recession is the next step. And so anyone who's out there at the moment who's spending all this money on fueling their car, fueling their house, uh, and then all the other stuff, your bills and stuff are all going up. If you had an opportunity to reduce your costs, would you take it? If you had an opportunity to move into a house where you didn't have to spend anything every month on heating your, your house, if your car, if you didn't have to pay for the diesel or the, or the, or the petrol for your car and instead could just plug your car in um, at, at night, I think we're moving in that direction. I think it's going to be a little bit like COVID. This is just my own opinion. Of course, I could be wrong. Uh, I've been known to be wrong before. But I just think that the big push towards sustainable energy and housing 
uh, highly insulated houses and, and a real incentive for people to start doing that. And then also EV cars and things like that. I think there's going to be a big push. Already you're seeing it, but I think it's going to be accelerated by the inflation and the cost of living. And then now this kind of ridiculous situation where fuel is, is possibly going to be rationed. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. So um, I just think that, you know, going back to the comment, and uh, thank you for your comments, by the way. Always like, like to get a comment. Just, I just think that we're in this situation now where it's just going to get worse. Costs are going to keep going up. And, and the only sort of defense you have against it is to start looking to actually have energy efficient homes, electric cars, and, uh, you know, wean yourself off having to use gas or uh, any kind of oil products or anything like that. So it's kind of like the perfect storm we're in at the moment. And so I think the only major defensive strategy for a consumer is to start looking at this stuff. So anyway, let me know whether you agree or disagree. I'm always interested to hear your comments. And that's all for me for this week. And I'll see you back here next week. Hey guys, it's me again. Quick favor before you go. If you could take a moment to just leave a quick review over on iTunes, or indeed, if you are watching this on YouTube, please just like it and leave a comment below. If you do have any questions or topics that you'd like me to cover in future episodes, leave a comment, join the Facebook group. Alternatively, send me a DM uh, via social media. And as you guys know, my handle is Gavin J. Gallagher. And don't forget to check out that link to the property investor readiness test down in the show notes. Right, so guys, that's it. I hope you are going to have an awesome week and we shall catch you all next week. <music>